we've developed the idea that because the Constitution separates church and state, we shouldn't really talk about religion at all in public. This is Faith Complex, a dialogue about the entanglement of religion, politics and art. Hello, my name is Jacques Berlinerblau of Georgetown University, and you're watching Faith Complex. Joining us today is the op-ed writer for the New York Times, and I would add the youngest person ever to hold that title. He is Ross Douthat. Mr. Douthat, welcome to Faith Complex. Thank you so much for having me. All right, well, we've been poring over your op-eds for the last couple of weeks here at Faith Complex. Love it. We're having such a great time reading you. I appreciate it. I, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm glad to hear it. And it seems that we notice a tendency in your writing, a kind of call for a more robust public discussion of religion. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. I, I mean, I think that one of the things that's happened in America is that, you know, American politics has a strong and appropriate um, emphasis on the separation of church and state. Um, but I think one of the things that's happened in American life, especially in the past century, in the past 50 years, is that that political separation has become cultural as well. And we've developed the idea that because the Constitution separates church and state, we shouldn't really talk about religion at all in public. And, and that these, I mean, the, the, theory, the theory of American liberalism originally is that if you protect um, religious discussion from state power, in fact, religious discussion will become more robust because it won't be constantly looking over its shoulder at the state. Mm -hmm. And for much of American history, I think that's been true. But I think it's somewhat less true today. I think people are, you know, you, you don't have that many op-ed writers who want to talk about religious doctrines and so on. But hasn't the conversation traditionally in the United States about religion been pretty damn robust? I mean, yes, do we have anything no, no. His, to, historically, to yeah, regret? But, well, but if you, look, if you look at, like, I mean, and some of this is, I think, a function of the kind of culture war mentality in the United States between, like, you know, the, the sort of, to stereotype a bit, the secular left and the religious right, where there is, in a sense, a robust conversation about religion, but the conversation is always about, you know, it's about abortion, mm -hmm. it's about gay marriage, and then maybe it's about a few hot-button issues like, you know, abstinence education and so on, or creationism in public schools. And all of these are important issues and issues that I'm interested in talking about, but they aren't always the, you know, the heart of the religious matter, you might say, right? So like Brit, Brit Hume, right? Mm -hmm. So there was a big incident, big to-do recently, where Brit Hume, talking about Tiger Woods, says, you know, well, you know, maybe, maybe the thing for Tiger Woods to do is to turn to Christianity because there's a greater emphasis on forgiveness in Christianity than in Buddhism and so on. Mm -hmm. Everybody freaks out about this and says, it's totally inappropriate for Brit Hume to be talking about these theological issues on cable news. Um, and, you know, I don't, I don't think it's inappropriate at all. I think there's actually a really interesting conversation to be had about the differences between Christianity and Buddhism. And it doesn't mean that Brit Hume is right about those differences, but it's a conversation worth having, and it's a conversation that's just as worth having as the conversation about um, gay marriage or abortion. I think. Well, I don't think it's inappropriate when Brit Hume speaks about these religious issues. The, the problem is that Brit Hume is not a credentialed theologian, so I don't think he brings anything to the table of any particular interest other than a rant, and this is the concept. I think well, I mean, I'm, look, I'm not a credentialed theologian mm -hmm. either, right? So by that standard, I, I mean, fair enough, mm -hmm. right? If, if you think that the conversation about religion in the U.S. should be held exclusively by credentialed theologians, then we are, we are going to disagree. Um, but, you know, Brit Hume is, first, he'd stepped out of his role at that point as a professional newscaster and become a professional commentator who now delivers his opinions directly on Fox News. And, uh, you know, I mean, do I trust Brit Hume on the theological difference between Christianity and Buddhism? Maybe not, but I don't trust most commentators in public, and I still think it's okay to have a robust public conversation on these issues. But haven't we seen again and again that religious dialogue in public gets a tad bit too robust, uh, Danish Islamic cartoon controversy robust, Pope Benedict tripping over the tripwire of Muslim sensibilities robust. We really want to go back there? Well, I mean, I think the reason that the Danish cartoon conversation became robust is because, frankly, Muslim residents of Europe didn't respect the 
you know, didn't respect the liberal settlement, where you're supposed to be allowed to have these kinds of conversations. But we've had this in the United States as well, between Catholics and Protestants in the mid-19th century, sure. having urban riots where people die over which translation of the Bible is going to be used in public school. What I'm saying is the secularist is beholden to a vision, and the secularist need not be a non-believer. The secularist sees religion as a kind of nitroglycerin, something which is volatile. Better to keep it down so that people can be religious in peace. Right, I, I, I understand that. But again, if you look at the particular examples that you cited of you know, Muslim cartoon controversy, what you end up saying there then is, for the sake of religious peace, we need to protect, you know, we need to treat religion as this kind of, you know, this thing we treat with kid gloves all the time, and we're always walking on eggshells and saying, well, you know, in Europe we can't offend our Muslim minorities, and in the U.S. we, you know, if we're in the South, we don't want to offend the Southern Baptists, we don't want to, you know, we don't want to do this, that, and the other thing. And I think, you know, if, if you take that, if you take that more than one or two steps too far, you end up in a place that secularists won't like very much mm -hmm. either, where you'll end up with a situation where secularists aren't allowed to say things about religion in general. I mean, if you look at like, the wave of new atheist books that's right. come out, obviously I don't agree with 95% of what's said in most of those books, but I think in a way that, you know, a Christopher Hitchens or a Daniel Dennett or any of these people do religion a favor by taking it seriously, by saying, you know, if this thing, religion, is comprehensively false, then we should be willing to say it's comprehensively false. And I guess I think that we are we're some distance in the United States away from the risk of re serious sustained religious warfare between mm. Catholics and Protestants, Buddhists and Christians. You know, Buddhists aren't going to take to the streets to riot. And because, why is that, Mr. And why, no, and why, why are we so far we away? We are so far from it because we established this right. kind of secular settlement. And mm -hmm. it's a good thing. The problem is all of these things... As with everything, there's a mean, there's a, hap there's a happy medium to be struck, and it's possible to take that medium so far that you stop having interesting conversations about religion in general. And that's a huge arena of human life that you're then sealing off from public conversation. It actually matters, the differences between Buddhist theology and Christian theology. These things matter. They have huge consequences. Eastern civilizations are different than Western civilizations in part because of these theological differences. If we can't talk about them, we're foreclosing a huge arena of important debate. I don't fully disagree with you. As I hear your argument, what you're saying, in culture we should have these discussions. But let's talk about politicians having these discussions, which might not be your claim. You're not claiming that it's a good thing for politicians to spout doctrine on the campaign trail, are you? No, I, I think that politicians have an obligation to stick to the the places where their religious beliefs do actually intersect with public policy issues. Mm -hmm. So I think it's fine for a politician to say, as a Christian in the public square, I feel compelled to oppose um, you know, pro-abortion legislation, for instance. I think it would be less appropriate for a politician to say, as a Christian in the public square, I would like to argue for laws that compel people to assent to the doctrine of the Immaculate um, uh, the Immaculate Conception, right? right? And, and I think that that is the distinction that American politics has successfully struck in the past, where if you look at our great political movements that were infused with religious energy, ranging from uh, the abolitionist movement in the 19th century, the social gospel, down through the civil rights movement, and I, and I would argue the right to life movement in the present day, they've, when, when they've succeeded, it's by you, taking a religious foundation and translating it into universal terms. You know your position is shockingly similar to that of one Barack Obama in the audacity of hope uh, on the proper place of religion in American public life. You cool with that? Um, I mean, I, I think overall that Obama made a very conscious effort in the 2008 campaign to steer himself away from, let's say, the kind of somewhat sterile secularism that people picked up on from the Democratic Dukakis Party. Dukakis secularism, right. Kerry and, secularism. Right. I mean, Kerry, Kerry is a complicated case because I think Kerry is, Dukakis I'm not so sure about. I think Kerry is a sort of, is an authentically religious person. But is. I think mm -hmm. he had trained himself to be deeply uncomfortable talking about his, how his religion influences his public views, whereas Obama was much more comfortable saying, and, and I think some of that is actually because the black church in the United States has always been much more comfortable with this kind of, you know, taking, taking a Christian message and translating it into political action. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no, I, I, I don't feel uncomfortable having little distance, that's like a triple negative there, but between myself and Obama on that issue. 
you can see this with, with Hollywood and the Iraq War, right? With movie after movie, and the war on terror more generally, you can see the sense from Hollywood directors that this will be the movie that grabs America by the lapels and yeah. convinces them that this gets war... Gets you off your keister into the streets, right, right. manning and, the barricades. Right. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. I mean, nobody goes to these movies.